The greatest mathematicians often tend to get credit for a lot of the discoveries done in their fields. But here are some mathematicians that didn't get as much credit as they deserve, and even got lost among these big names. The first, Adrienne Marie Legendre. Legendre worked across several fields, like analysis, geometry, and number theory. He studied special functions that now bear his name, the Legendre polynomials. And he produced extensive work on elliptic integrals, which was later refined and surpassed by mathematicians Abel and Jacobi. Although, of course, he did plenty of work, his most celebrated contribution was in 1805, with the introduction of the least squares criterion for curve fitting, which he developed in the context of calculating the orbits of comets. Suppose you have points 1, 2, 4, 4, 7, 4, and 8, 5, and you want a straight line prediction. Try line y equals x plus 1. The residuals are 0, minus 1, minus 4, and minus 4. Square each one of these residuals, and then add them up. The result is 33, and this is the residual sum of squares, or RSS. Now try y equals x over 2 plus 3 halves. The residuals are 0, 1 half, minus 1, and minus 1 half. The residual sum of squares here is 3 halves. Because 3 halves is less than 33, the second line is better by Legendre's rule, because you need to choose the model that makes the sum of squared errors smallest. The grasping least squares example is just an illustration of the least squares principle, which shows numerically how Legendre's rule picks the best fit among all possible models. Of course, we used a linear model for simplicity, but you can easily imagine how to generalize it to exponential, logarithmic, and oscillatory tendencies. Legendre published the rule explicitly first, but Gauss later presented the same method a few years later, after having linked it to probability theory. Since he used it earlier to compute the elliptical orbit of the famous dwarf planet Ceres, because of that, Gauss tends to be given more credit. Second, François Viette. The work for which Viette is known is Introduction to the Analytic Art. There, Viette began to combine classical Greek geometry with algebraic methods that had originated from Islamic sources. And by doing so, he laid the foundations for the algebraic approach to geometry. Imagine a right triangle. Let's say you know the length of the hypotenuse and one of the legs. The value of the other leg is unknown. Viet's innovation was to treat all given knowns and unknowns with symbols, not numbers. Viet used constants for knowns and vowels for unknowns. So instead of plugging in actual numbers immediately, Viet worked in general. Using the Pythagorean relationship, he would write something like the square of the unknown a added to the square of the known b equals the square of the known c. In symbols, the expression can be translated to this. From the equation, we get this. So therefore, this is true. This might seem like an easy thing to you, an obvious thing, but in Viet's time, it was a big deal to have an algebraic method express things in general in terms of givens. He then wouldn't stop at algebra, but would show how to construct the length a with a ruler and compass, and would turn the result from algebra into geometry. A generation later, Descartes' La Géométrie made this program dominant by introducing coordinate geometry and cleaner symbolic notation. Fermat independently developed analytic geometry too. Because their notation and coordinate method became standard, historians tend to credit Descartes and Fermat as founders of analytic geometry, and yet is considered to be more of a precursor. 3. Bernard Boldano Boldano was one of the first to push mathematics toward real rigor in analysis. In 1817, he proved an early version of the intermediate value theorem. Say we have some continuous function f of x, and we choose a value s. The points mark where the curve intersects that line, so in other words, where f of x equals s. If f is continuous and at one point f of x is below s, while at another point it is above s, 
then the function must cross the line f of x equals s somewhere in between. At the time, mathematicians believed that a continuous function must be differentiable, except at some isolated points. But Bolzano actually constructed a counterexample to that assumption. The function Bolzano built in the early 1830s is usually called Bolzano's Snorr differentiable function. Unfortunately, he never published it. So no one knew about it until historians later reconstructed it from his manuscripts. And it's now recognized as the first known example of a function that is continuous everywhere, but differentiable nowhere more than 30 years before Wirtz-Strasse's famous 1872 example. We put a lot of effort in our videos, so we would really appreciate if you could subscribe to the channel and like this video. Fourth, Ernst Edward Coomer. He made important contributions in several fields, like function theory and algebraic geometry. But his greatest discovery was in number theory. Coomer originally wanted to generalize the law of quadratic reciprocity, which was first proved by Gauss, to higher powers. So he basically says that, let P and Q be distinct odd prime numbers, and define the Legendre symbol as this, Q over P, such that this is 1 if there is an integer number n such that n squared is equivalent to Q module P, or it's minus 1 otherwise. Then, the law says that, multiplying this Legendre symbol with its reciprocal, we get this expression, minus 1 to the power of these exponents. As a concrete example of this law, let's pick p equals 13 and q equals 3. Now let's check if 3 is a square module 13, so 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, and so on for other numbers. And we find that 4 squared is 16, which is equivalent to 3 module 13. Therefore, 4 is our number n. And we can write this in the Legendre symbol as 3 over 13 being 1. Now check if 13 is a square in module 3. 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, which is equivalent to 1 in module 3. Therefore, our number n is 1 or 2. Now we multiply them, and we basically get 1. So we can verify the law. Just plug in p equals 13 and q equals 3, and you're going to see that indeed it is 1. Of course, this is not a proof, but it's just a verification that it works in this particular case. Kummer wanted to generalize this law for higher powers, so 3, 4, 5, and so on. But let's understand something first. We can factorize any integer into prime factors, and this factorization is unique, up to reordering the factors and multiplying them by minus 1. But this idea can be extended. For example, we can consider the Gaussian integers, which is the set of complex numbers of the form a plus bi, where a and b are integers. In this number system, 5 is not considered a prime, for example. Because you can factorize it into 1 plus 2i times 1 minus 2i. However, 3 is still prime, because the only way to factorize it would be into the square root of 2 plus i times the square root of 2 minus i. But the problem is that the square root of 2 is not an integer, and therefore these factors are not Gaussian integers by definition. What is cool about that is that Gaussian integers also have unique factorizations. Any Gaussian integer can be written as a product of irreducibles, so elements that cannot be further factored into non-units. But is this always true? I mean, is it true that for any number you can think of, there is always a unique way of factorizing it? And the answer is, unfortunately not. The Gaussian integers are an example of a ring in mathematics. There are many others, but if you don't know what it is, just think of it as something that has addition and multiplication. Both of those are associative, commutative, and the distribution property is true here. There are some rings that do not present this uniqueness in factorization. One example is the ring z square root of minus 5, which are the numbers of the form a plus b square root of minus 5, with a and b being integers. Take 6, for example. We can break it into 2 times 3, or into 1 plus the square root of minus 5 times 1 minus the square root of minus 5. We just factorize it into two different elements of the same ring. 
This was a problem because one of the first attempts to prove Fermat's last theorem was to factorize the equation over some extension of the integers, which is also called a ring of integers, and then use unique prime factorization to show that this failed. But if we can't have unique prime factorization, then it doesn't even make sense to use this approach. So Kummer had a brilliant idea. He said that, though it's true that for a general ring of integers, prime factorization was impossible, one could come up with a concept of an ideal number. And you could uniquely factor an element from a ring of integers into such ideal numbers. In the example of z square root of minus 5, you would replace the existing primes with these ideal numbers. And therefore, you have unique factorization. Decades later, Richard Dedekind took Kummer's idea and generalized it by introducing ideals in ring theory and proved their unique factorization. Rings with this property are now called Dedekind domains. They are basically conceptual successors of Kummer's ideal primes. 5. James Joseph Sylvester James Joseph Sylvester was a 19th century algebraist who made various significant contributions but his most famous was helping to create the modern field of invariant theory and the related notion of covariance, alongside the more famous mathematician Arthur Cayley. More concretely speaking, they focused on devising techniques for explicitly finding invariance and covariance of binary forms and determining their algebraic relations, otherwise known as syzygies. Sylvester focused on resolving these questions in two important papers. And in this one, he proved, among other results, Sylvester's law of inertia. The gist of it is that any real quadratic expression can be turned by a change of coordinates into a sum of positive squares minus a sum of negative squares, and possibly some zeros. The numbers of plus and minus squares you get are fixed no matter how you change coordinates. That fixed pair is the inertia. Take this example. So it has one plus, represented by this happy face shape, and one minus, represented by this sad face shape. This is a saddle. No invertible change of variables can make it two pluses or two minuses. It'll always stay one plus, one minus. That's the law. Even though Sylvester collated invariant theory and even coined the term matrix, the grand results came from Cayley. Because of that, historical credit in broad algebra tends to go to Cayley, and Sylvester's role is sometimes noted, but it's not very often remembered. 6. Charles-Jean de la Vallée-Poussin Charles-Jean de la Vallée-Poussin was a Belgian mathematician whose main achievement was his 1896 proof of the prime number theorem, which was first conjectured by Gauss. If you ask yourself how many prime numbers are there between 1 and n, a natural first reaction would be to define pi of n to be the number of prime numbers between 1 and n and to search for a formula for pi of n. The thing is that there's no obvious pattern to primes, and we don't really have a formula that can just spit them out. So instead, Poussin looked for a good estimate. The prime number theorem tells us just that. As n grows larger, the number of primes less than n, written as pi of n, is approximately this. Primes get less frequent as numbers grow larger, but they do so in a way that's closely ruled by logarithmic decay. After proving this, Poisson realized that he could even strengthen it. He showed that the better approximation is the logarithmic integral, and proved an error that actually shrinks fast. So, not only do we know the right scale, we also know how close pi of n is to the real number of primes in this range. Hadamard proved the prime number theorem independently in the same year by similar complex methods, so many accounts lead with Hadamard and de la Vallée-Poussin. Hadamard tends to be mentioned first because his name is more recognized. Yet these improvements, the explicit zero-free region, the corresponding error bounds, and the progression version are de la Vallée-Poussin's alone and directly explain how the approximation becomes precise. Poisson's proof is arguably stronger, though, because he gave a sharper error term and extended it to primes in arithmetic progressions. This list is just a preview of some of the mathematicians that were important figures in developing math, but might not get enough credit or might be overshadowed by other mathematicians. Let us know if you think there are any other mathematicians that don't get enough credit or get overshadowed by a greater figure in math. Don't forget that you can check out the PDF link in the description that summarizes everything we've talked about here. 
If you like this video, I'm sure you're going to love this one. See you guys there.